Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to COVID, crisis management, business continuity, resilience, well-being, anything that can help you, your organization, or your community plan for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there, so I'm really easy to find, and I do respond to everything I get. One quick announcement, I will be at the BCI Hybrid World uh, Conference, November 2nd and 3rd in London, UK. I am giving a keynote speech with my colleague, Margaret Millett, and I'm really looking forward to that. And so far, it's in person, so I uh, hope to see you there. As you can see by the screen, if you're watching on YouTube, it's that time again. Regina Phelps, welcome back. Alex, as always, it's great to be with you. And I have a lot of different things to talk about today. We do. And, uh, you know, this is about the uh, 25th or 26th talk that we've had. about 25 months in a row? Yeah. Would you believe? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Who would have believed that, right? <clears throat> yeah, considering we thought, you know, maybe a year at the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, but... <laughs> Yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can I say? Well, why don't we jump into our first first update and uh, what's happening with COVID? Well, thank you. You know, as, as you and I were talking before we actually started, uh, people are going to think that that's all I do is diseases. And in reality, historically, <laughs> it used to be, uh, you know, five or 10% of our business was about diseases. But Oh my goodness, I just keep doing, I keep being in that space. So we have a variety of disease things to talk about today. So let's talk about COVID to start with. So where are we globally? So we are actually uh, in some places of the world in a pretty good place. And what do I mean by that? So BA5, our current hyper variant of the Omicron family is now starting to decrease in many parts of the world. Certainly here in the United States, we've hit our peak. Uh, it is now going down. However, we are at a very high place for us to have this sort of decline. What do I mean by that? We still are having on an average between 450 to 500 people in the US dying every single day of COVID. Now that's a lot of people. And a severe flu season in the United States will result in an extreme flu season would be maybe 50,000 deaths a, day, a year wow. from flu. So here we are in the United States with around 450 to 500 people dying every day. So you do the math on that times 360, and that is a lot more people than 50,000 folks dying in a severe flu season. So we are at a very high plat uh, plateau, if you will. Uh, that will probably decrease over time, but the lowest it's gotten in the last um, 20, well, 24 months has probably been somewhere around 200 people a, a year dying, a day dying. So it's still really, really high. So here in the U.S., we're doing better. Good. And the CDC has actually changed their guidelines, which I'll talk about just for a moment. But let me just touch base with you before I talk about the world and also the United States. What's going on in Canada? In Canada, let me see. I did my uh, little. I know you did your homework. Look see, look see this morning. You know, um, we now have uh, the Pfizer uh, was approved. Pfizer vaccine was approved for kids under five. Oh, good. So now we've got a couple of them, um, and that's, uh, uh, well, a lot of kids are getting their needles. I can't remember the the number, and I didn't see a number this morning, but a lot. It's probably are. better than ours. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> um, overall, COVID cases and hospitalizations have um, stabilized, mm -hmm. and in the, quite a few areas are starting to trend down. Um, however, the numbers at this point, and you kind of uh, touched on this already, uh, are actually higher than they were last summer. Mm -hmm. So, but they are, you know, on, on the decline right now, which is good. Uh, we don't have any mask mandates anywhere, though, uh, obviously, uh, it seems to be an unwritten rule right now that if you're going into a doctor's office, healthcare, long-term care, home, anything like that, everybody's wearing a mask. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think people are questioning it anymore where they used to. It just Mm -hmm. becomes automatic. I'm not wearing a mask the rest of the day. As soon as I walk into a doctor's office, everyone's got a mask. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't even need to be asked. Um, I do find it interesting that uh, places like grocery stores, uh, the workers are not wearing masks anymore or Mm -hmm. uh, record stores or pharmacies, wherever you're going, they're not wearing masks but the plexiglass is still there. So I just find that, <laughs> I find that kind of interesting. That may never go away. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. You know, don't get too close to me. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, schools start in two weeks, but so far there is no call for mask mandates for students. Yep. So um, we'll see where that goes, but right now uh, it's okay. And overall our, let's see if I can read my scribbles here. Um, doses, the uh, the primary set of doses, we uh, are up to anywhere between eighty two and eighty five percent of people that have got their uh, needles. So, wow. things are from a COVID perspective, things are doing good. Obviously, there's healthcare issues with workers and things like that that uh, that are uh, not going so well. Mm-hmm. Um, now that uh, some of them are retiring, some of them are mm-hmm. leaving. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them, uh, well, the baby boomers, you know, and their uh, age and illnesses that come with you know, old age, unfortunately, are starting to hit. And after the pandemic, I don't think anyone's prepared. So we've got a different crisis coming our yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could talk about that for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and to that end, I just want to talk a little bit about the world. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about the U.S. and what we're recommending to our clients. Uh, when you look at what's going on in the world, you'll see now that there are some interesting things still happening. So most of the world is starting to now, we're on the downhill side of BA5. Uh, there are still some places that are still um, having some pretty interesting spikes. And that, uh, uh, interestingly enough, is those countries that have been very, very safe up to this point. So Japan, Hmm. for example, they still have the highest death toll um, daily for the last three weeks. Japan, who had very few deaths Hmm. in total. Also, Australia, New Zealand, which of course had zero spread of the illness in the first 18 months or so of the actual pandemic. And so they have also experienced, well, they have a very high vaccination rate, but remember, it's from the uh, uh, primarily a two dose series uh, shot that they've mm-hmm. had. Yeah. And what that means is that they those two doses, if you only have two doses, it is not very effective against BA5. And they've had a huge amount of illness because primarily folks only had a couple of doses, both in Japan and also in um, Australia and New Zealand. So those are still mm-hmm. bubbling up and are still significant. Mm. Now, in the United States, uh, we still have a large number of cases every day. I mean, uh, the case count doesn't really matter anymore, to be honest with you, because so so many people, as many folks like Canada, I'm sure, are doing home testing, Mm -hmm. and therefore uh, you're not reporting that. And so you may see for us to have, say, 900,000 cases a day or 500,000 cases a day, it's probably five or 10 times higher than that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's, but it's going down. So what is what is the new CDC requirements? They have pretty much said that no longer when you're exposed to somebody with, an, with a COVID that you have to isolate or quarantine, you basically are being asked to wear a mask for, uh, for five to 10 days. Uh, what happens if you actually get COVID? Uh, you basically need to isolate for five days and then you can go about your life wearing a mask for, uh, from that point on for another five days. So my clients are all asking me, what should we be doing? And this is our advice to all of our clients, pretty much. And that is if you can work remotely and that's successfully being done in your organization, the question is, why are you coming back right now when still things are a little bit in flux? So most of our clients Mm -hmm. still have a large percentage of their employees working remotely. If you are in a public place and you would like to be safe, the best thing you can do to be safe is wear a mask. Yeah. Now, I'll be honest with you. I live in San Francisco and we still are pretty mask conscious here, interestingly enough, but still I go to places and people don't have masks on. I have gone to many places uh, for work in the last uh, two months and I don't see a soul anywhere with a mask on. So it really depends on the area that you're in. But if you want to be safe, if you don't want to get COVID, the best thing you can do in a public space, especially one that might be at all crowded, is to wear a mask. Now, 
The other thing I recommend to our clients is if you're going to have people at work, have them wear a mask unless they're in their own office. The other thing that you can do is to make sure that you have adequate ventilation. So that means that you want to have good air exchanges within your building at least three mm -hmm. or four times an hour. You want to have HEPA filters. And obviously, if people are sick, they need to stay home. The world has moved on, as we all know, about COVID, right? I think that you'll see that any place around the world, for the most part, people want to get back to their lives. And so people are acting accordingly. If you are immunosuppressed, if you are older, if you have uh, lung or pulmonary conditions or cardiac issues, you might want to think twice about how you go about your life uh, because you really don't want to get sick. And yeah. so those are things that people need to really think about. So that's where we are right now. But, oh, but, but, <laughs> yeah. There Couldn't end two, on a good note, could you? I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, are, there are two <laughs> variants that people should be thinking about. One is what's called BA 4.6 and BA 2.75. These are all in the Omicron family. BA 4.6 has a variety of mutations beyond BA5 that makes it slightly more contagious than BA5. It's about 10% more infectious. It has uh, its mutations. It has pretty much everything that BA5 has. It has a few more mutations, not on the spike, but on the actual um, uh, other core of the virus. Now, again, 10% more infectious than BA5. So BA5 in the United States is still the big, you know, bad guy. But if you go to the CDC variant site, you will actually see that BA 4.6 is actually now encroaching into BA5's territory. We don't know what that's going to mean. It could be that it actually becomes the big bad guy in the next 30 days or not. And we'll see. The other one to be concerned about and be watching is BA 2.75, which is coming out of India. That one has been really impacting India in a very significant way, just like it was uh, with Delta or Omicron. I can't even remember anymore. That I, I think, think it was, was Delta. I think it was Delta that actually ripped yeah. through India. It's ha having the same kind of effect. Now, whether that will result in that kind of disease spread in the United States or the rest of the world, we are yet to see. But that is one that's also on the horizon. And so, again, will people change their behavior? I don't know, Alex. I don't know if people are going to change their behavior. Unless people start dropping dead on the street, I don't think that's going to change anybody's behavior. But we should be aware of that. And I think what this is requiring is that for everybody to have their own personal sense of risk tolerance. How comfortable mm -hmm. are you in getting COVID? How comfortable are you in facing something like a long COVID illness, which is still impacting, depending on who you talk to, between 10 and 20% of all infections result in a long COVID diagnosis. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I think people need to, to, to rate their own willingness for risk and act accordingly. If you want to minimize your chance of getting sick, the best thing you can do is wear a mask. And I still, I mean, I was just in Alaska for two weeks on vacation with my husband. We had a mask on a lot of the time. I'm, you know, just because it was, I don't want to get sick. So. And I still wear one when I go out. I was actually at the mall. Remember those <clears throat> places? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was at the mall a week ago and Almost no one had a mask. There were a few of us, but I made sure I had one. And, yeah. You know, it, it, it's nice to be out and about, but there's still a part of me that's being cautious because, you know, who knows? So uh, I I still wear a mask, grocery shopping or going to the mall or something like that. You know, I mm -hmm. still have it. The other thing I would say is that uh, in, in our closing comments here related to COVID is that when you look at um, what's going to happen going forward, you'll see a lot of different talking heads that are disease professionals on interviews saying, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, people, it could be bad in the winter. Well, I just want to say to you that no one really knows. So when you hear that, the question is, is it going to be bad? I don't know. But what does happen in many parts of the world is that when it gets cooler, in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, it's going to be cooler. And many places like in Toronto where it snows, 
people are going to be more indoors. And when you mm -hmm. have, or you're more indoors, you probably have less good ventilation. You're going to be in close proximity with others. And therefore, there's always a better chance of disease spread. Does that mean it's because the virus has become more dangerous or more infectious? Not necessarily, unless it's a new variant. But we're going to be in situations, again, where we're in close proximity, inside, if you're not wearing a mask, you don't have good ventilation, et cetera, you're going to have a greater chance of getting infected. So that is in our possible future. What I would say to all of our listeners, if they are concerned at all about getting COVID uh, and you have any risks personally, what you might really want to consider is always having a mask in your pocket and judge accordingly when you walk into a space as to how you feel. I'll just tell you, for me, I just walk in, I have a mask on before I even hit the door. Uh, but for a lot of people, they sort of scope it out and then act accordingly. But be prepared. You know, do you want to be in a room with people, especially if you see anybody who's sick? You know, just think twice about that and get your mm -hmm. flu shot. And when boosters come out for the new, um, here in the United States, we're going to have a new variant, uh, a bivalent vaccine, which will have both Omicron as well as the ancestral strain. You're going to really want to get that booster. And if you haven't had all of your shots, which is two in the United States, as a as a baseline, and then we have a third and fourth booster. Get them, get them now, mm -hmm. please. <laughs> yep, I have. Good. And Good. I'll be getting the flu shot again too. Yeah. Yes, and the flu shots <clears throat> starting that season is about ready to happen, and you should be looking yeah. at getting the flu shot sometime uh, end of September, early part of October. Yeah, closer than you think. Yes, indeed. So let's move to another happy topic: uh, monkeypox. Uh, monkeypox. All right. So let's talk briefly about that. Uh, the CDC in the United States has a monkeypox tracker. I'll send that to you, Alex, and you can put it on the, the your site as far okay. as people referencing it. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, we've talked about it a lot uh, in our um, last conversation. But so currently right now, I, I don't remember where we were when last time we talked. I think it just had really started out. Uh, with really starting to spread. There are 42,000 cases now worldwide uh, affecting 97 countries. Seven of those countries historically have always had monkeypox in their, it's endemic in that those countries. But that means that 87 have never had it before. Wow. And so let's talk about what your chances are of having an infection with monkeypox. First of all, monkeypox is spread primarily because you would be touching somebody's lesions who you, you'd be in skin to skin contact with somebody. You were mentioning before we started about the story about somebody who actually was, I believe it was in some place in Europe that was at a music festival uh, where people, it was really hot and people were pretty bare skinned. And he actually got monkeypox, he believes, from that encounter, not from sex, but just in touching, you know, dancing and hugging and all of that stuff. Um, that's all it needs to happen is that somebody could have a lesion somewhere on their body and you touch that and you become in contact with that. Currently right now, about 86% of all the cases have been associated with sex, men having sex with men are called the MSM group. But I want to remind us all that this is a, an infectious disease. It's not a gay disease. It has been found and it has occurred in young children toddlers and within a household, housekeepers have gotten it. Um, anybody who has the opportunity to be in, in, in either skin to skin contact with somebody, even sheets or towels that might have secretions on them, that's a form of infection. Veterinarians, veterinarian assistants, laboratory professionals, healthcare providers, daycare, school teachers. I mean, there's a lot of places where this could transmit. Mm -hmm. So a couple things that's really important for people to consider is that think about the risk. And so everybody was thinking, oh, okay, it's just within the gay community or just when people are having sex. What I want you to think about is this continues to spread. It's going to be increasingly in places where none of those things have happened. And again, think of veterinarians, think of healthcare providers, laboratory professionals, school teachers, daycare, wrestlers in a college match. When college mm -hmm. starts this fall, when school begins to happen, there can be disease transmission, especially in college. You don't know what people are doing sexually. You have no idea how things are going to transmit. 
there is a big opportunity for this to really begin to spread. And so people need to be very aware of this. Uh, currently, right now, the only people that are encouraged to get vaccinated with the small pox, it is a smallpox vaccine. The only people that are encouraged to get vaccinated are those people at the highest risk. And currently, right now, that is basically the MSN community, men who have sex with men. However, is a very likelihood that colleges and other places where this could start to really take off are going to start looking at vaccines. And as more and more vaccines become available in the US and probably likely in Canada as well, there may be changes in vaccine recommendations related to smallpox slash monkeypox. So people need to think about that. The biggest concern that we have in the field of medicine is what happens if if this illness drops into an animal reservoir. Think about uh, um, uh, coronavirus or, or SARS-CoV-2 COVID and the deer population. It's in deer. Think about mm -hmm. monkeypox getting into rodents, which is, by the way, where it comes from. Not monkeys, rodents. So if it got into rats, if it got into mice, could we ever eradicate that? The answer is no. And it would be a disease that would be with us forever again. Mm -hmm. So why I'm saying all that is not to make people anxious or to scare them, but it is something that we all need to be paying attention to. Um, and there may be a, re a requirement going forward for people to actually get revaccinated for smallpox slash monkeypox in order to protect themselves. But it's not just, again, a sex sexually transmitted illness. It could happen a lot. And if you have college age kids, I'd be really concerned about them. Did you, or I'm not sure if you said it actually, did you say that it's been found in animals, dogs? Uh, and actually one dog has been infected mm -hmm. in France. There was a dog where a gay couple, you know, the dog slept with them every night. Uh, it was in contact with sheets and towels. That animal mm -hmm. got um, monkeypox. So, wow. yeah. So that's what I mean. It's, it's, it, you know, we think, oh, okay, it's not going to affect me. But, you know, it could. It's all about skin-to-skin -skin contact, contact with bedding, towels. Uh, and veterinarians should be aware of it because they can see animals come in with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Laboratory professionals, healthcare professionals, et cetera. I know there's another one we're going to talk about, but we're already at 21 minutes. So let's take right. a quick break uh, to catch our breath and have a drink of water. Uh, we're talking with Regina Phelps today, and we will be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Regina Phelps. Regina, lots of good information there in the uh, first segment uh, where COVID is going and what we really need to know about monkeypox. Um, those are both health you know, concerns we need to be aware of, but there's something else in the health industry we need to be aware of of what's happening as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I think this is really based on one of your comments that we had earlier on in that first segment, and that is the issue related to staffing shortages. What we're experiencing in the United States, I believe, is Canada as well, but you can talk about that in a second. Uh, and also worldwide is shortages that are occurring in two areas that are really beginning to impact um, people in their daily life. The first is here in the United States is a medical shortage of personnel. So that's nurses, physicians, you name it, laboratory professionals, x-ray people, nurses, aides. Uh, we've experienced a real uh, drop in people that are entering those fields or they're leaving early or they're done. And part of that, I think, is because if you look at, I mean, just think how all of us have suffered in COVID in the last two and a half years. People in the health community have really had a hard time. Not only have they endured um, really awful situations with staffing and illnesses and huge amount of deaths. I mean, way more than anybody would have ever expected to see in 20 lifetimes, let alone one two and a half year segment, um, that it's really impacted people's willingness to be in the health profession. Now, there's a lot of people coming in the pipeline, yes, but they're not here now. And here in the United States in particular, it's really hard, for example, in many communities for them to have a uh, a change doctor, for example, because 
many doctors are not taking new patients. They're, they're capped out. This is also, by the way, especially for ob obstetrics and gynecology, even further with the repeal of Roe v. Wade here in the United States, that's impacted healthcare in another way. But what I want to say is that that's a huge impact that many people are surprised about, but that's impacting people every day. But it's not just healthcare; It's also teachers. The mm -hmm. United States is facing the largest teacher shortage they have ever had in the history of the country when they've been keeping track. There are many schools who are 20 or 30 percent down on teachers. So class sizes are becoming larger. Mm -hmm. Teachers are really fried. And I think this is a big, big problem that could actually impact businesses. And you think, oh, how could it impact a business? Well, think about schools who all of a sudden may have to cancel classes or really restrict classes. Think about people who are not able to get the kind of health care that they might need, especially in more rural areas or ways or, or, country, or parts of the country in the United States that are away from these big urban centers. And so I think it's something that we need to be thinking about, about as an employer, what do we do about being able to support and, and really assist in ways that maybe we never thought of about things like education, like healthcare. And so my question to you is, are you seeing any kind of shortages in Canada? Yes, to both of those. Um, I'm hearing more in the healthcare industry than teachers but it is happening with teachers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you pointed out some are retiring. Um, some have just given up, you know, the, right. the amount of work that got put on their shoulders um, in both industries during the pandemic. Um, you know, you can only take so much stress before you have to take a step back and say, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, the one of the things I mentioned during our break is during the uh uh, pandemic, at least the biggest part of it. I know it's not over, but the 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 two big big years we had, um, anti vaxxers and people mm. that were against uh, mask mandates and everything else, calling it a hoax and everything, you know, made death threats yeah. and uh, verbal abuse against teachers and healthcare workers, and you know, standing out front of schools screaming at parents and their kids, you know, and the teachers and nurses and doctors uh, and other. Uh, healthcare professionals trying to get into mm -hmm. hospitals to do their job, you know, were threatened and uh, abused. Scientists, you know, trying to find a cure, saying, you know, you're just making this up, you know, right. so you can get paid, you know, and, um, you know, looking down on the scientific community, which is rather interesting because I'm sure if someone turns around and says, I have a cure for cancer, all of a sudden they'll be a hero. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Right. I, right, right. I, I know that sounds funny, but it's, it's true. You know, it's true. It's true. It's so true. we we are experiencing both of those here, and I don't think there's a quick answer mm -hmm. um, because some, of, like I said, some of them are leaving. Um, some of them are baby boomers, you know, that are at the end of their uh, careers, so they're leaving early or they're um, leaving now because that is a huge um, right. uh, percentage of the population right now, right. and they are also experiencing health issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and they're now, older and they're older and it's like, yeah. who needs this, right? Yeah. And now there's a shortage. And as mm -hmm. more and more people, um, you know, that are older experiencing health issues, it's even a bigger strain on everybody. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're experiencing both. And uh, it it's kind of, it can be a little scary when you think about it. You know, what happens if I get ill? Am I going to be, right. um, you know, be able to be looked at? You know, right. it be somebody there for me. Right. So, you know, yeah, is... that's 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 so important. And I think I think as you were mentioning and, and sort of just taking a moment to riff off of that a little bit, the issue about uh, the lack of respect. I listened to um, a uh, podcast yesterday that was a group of teachers that were just talking about that they were tired of being bemoaned and belittled by parents or or other individuals that they were just done. They you know that they didn't feel respected. They didn't feel valued. And that they could make, you know, a living doing something else. And they were giving up their careers. And many people had been teachers for 10 or 20 years that maybe had another 20 years left in them, let's say, in their profession, but they were done. And I think that that's an important issue that we societally are now going to have to deal with about the loss of, 
uh, these critical roles in society. And even if you say, well, gee, I don't have kids and I don't care. No, 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 no. Societally, these they're, they're training our future. And so mm-hmm. they're so important. And the same thing with healthcare. We all need healthcare professionals. And in many parts of the United States, that's becoming an increasingly significant challenge. So I think we all need to understand that our behavior and how we treat others, not only in the workplace, but in all of these ancillary uh, professions that we deal with, has uh, you know big, big, big implications going forward. And we are now going to be paying for that for a period of time, based yeah. on a lot of people's ill and poor behavior over the course of the last two and a half years. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, I I don't know how people and, and more power to them. You know, could be able to walk into their offices knowing that outside their doors, you know, are death threats or they're receiving yeah. emails, you know, that are uh, negative in nature and, you know, uh, just the, the verbal abuse, you mm-hmm. know, and the, yet many of them still were going to it. But even them, you know, at, at some point, they're, they're going to say enough. Mm-hmm. I can't do this anymore. Yep. You know? yep. And yep. Who, do, who do we have to blame for that? Right. I mean, societally, we all have to look in the mirror and say, what have we what have we done to contribute to this? And I think it will become an issue that's not going to affect us just personally, but will affect communities, the health of communities, businesses. Um, And so it's something that we all need to take a little, you know, personal responsibility for our contribution to that uh, going forward. And uh, I think it's going to be a big issue for not just the United States and Canada, but probably most countries around the world. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with that and i hope it i hope people wake up and realize you know mm-hmm. stop being part of the part of the uh you know the, the problem, problem. Mm-hmm. and you know look at like she said look in the mirror and uh you know make yourself part of the solution mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i i really hope something changes and uh kudos to all the uh, teachers and uh healthcare workers that are out there that may be listening to great job thank you very much absolutely absolutely spot so, on we will move to our next one, which is polio. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I have to say to you, Alex, of all the years I've been in practice, by the way, this is my 40th year, 19. I started my company in 1982. Oh, my God. I never, ever, 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 ever thought I would be talking about polio. So Alex, you know, I never ever thought I would actually be talking about polio, but here I am. Uh, As you probably well know, there have been uh, cases of polio both in the UK and also in the United States. And because of that, I find myself here on August 22nd talking about polio with you. So um, most people don't know much about polio because thankfully it's hasn't been an issue here in the United States and Canada really since about the um, mid 60s. And that's because Mm of vaccines. Oh yes, vaccines. So let me just talk about what it is. And so uh, as a tutorial, so that we're all on the same page. So polio, poliomyelitis is actually a very contagious viral infection that's caused by a type of enterovirus. And it's characterized by paralysis weakness in the arms, legs, or both. And here in the United States, I don't know about Canada because I didn't look it up, but here in the United States, there's been no cases of what's called wild type polio, which I'll talk more in a minute, since 1979. 1979. Uh, People who are not vaccinated can get polio at any age. People might recall seeing historically, or if you just go back and look at those images, I mean, look at these images, right? These two black and white images from the top. Now this kid's in a, how she could be smiling in an iron lung. Look at that iron lung. It looks like it's made out of a 55 gallon can. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it does. All those kids are smiling. They're in iron lungs. And that's because polio can actually affect your respiratory muscles and you can't breathe. And an iron lung actually presses in on your chest and then releases. And that's how you're breathing. That's how it was done in the um, all the way up until the you know mid 60s when that stopped here in the United States. Um, so, yes, polio can affect all of the muscle groups, including your chest, 
which means that you would actually then be unable to breathe. So um, people who are not vaccinated can get polio at any age. And the reason I wanted to go back up and see those photographs is very commonly it affects kids, but it can affect anybody. Like the person not that long ago in New York who was in their 20s that was exposed to polio and actually got paralytic polio, which means the inability to move, walk. Oof. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how does polio spread? Now we're all keenly interested in it. It's an enterovirus, which means it comes from the intestines. So essentially polio can spread to others through feces, right? On hands or objects. So this goes back to our old friend, hand washing, which I know during the pandemic, there was initially like, oh my God, how does the COVID virus spread? And everybody was washing their hands ad nauseum, realizing it actually spreads through aerosol. That took us a little bit of time to get to that. But this is where hand washing, keeping surfaces clean is really important because that's how this virus is spread. So, yeah, you know, after, after using the bathroom, of course, washing your hands, uh, if you're changing diapers, so that's childcare, um, um, you know, daycare, parents washing their hands, but it could also be spread through virus through sal some saliva and respiratory droplets. But the primary form of transmission is the enteroviruses, which are again through feces. So a person can spread this virus before and up to two weeks after they've had some, before they've had their first symptoms. So that means I get infected. I'm not symptomatic yet, but I could actually begin to spread it uh, for about uh, up to about two weeks. And as long as there is virus present in saliva, in feces, that person can be infectious. So it can be spreading um, again from people who don't even know they have symptoms like monkeypox uh, initially mm -hmm. where it can actually, or COVID where there's this period of time. So think about hand washing. Think about all of those basic issues, surfaces, doorknobs. I mean, that's what we're talking about is that kind of transmission, right? If people use the restroom, don't wash their hands, they're infectious, they don't know it, they touch a doorknob, they touch you know, a, 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 you know, a, a railing on a staircase or they uh, are in a subway system and they're touching the, the, you know, the straps. All of that is what we're talking about. Now, this is what's numbing to me. So I got this from the New York uh, <clears throat> City uh, website for health in uh, New York City. Uh, <clears throat> shocking to me, they actually divided the boroughs and you can see how many people are vaccinated and who is not by borough and by neighborhood in New York City. Now, what's stunning to me is that only 86.2% of the population of New York City is polio vaccinated. 86.2. How could that be? Look at all those paler colors of blue. Those are neighborhoods with very poor vaccine coverage. Now, this is just New York City. Now, I would be interested about places in Canada, places anywhere around the world, other cities in the United States. What is their vaccine coverage? This has been something where, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> in this country, as these diseases that have been so devastating in the past have become less of an issue, many people say, well, why am I vaccinating my kids? Because polio isn't around here. So part of that, along with a general anti-vax sentiment has really led to large numbers of people I mean, 14% of New York City is not vaccinated. That just blows me away. Do you have any sense about polio uptake and vaccines in your country? Honestly, I can say no, I don't. Um, because, Like I said during the break, I grew up <clears throat> believing there was polio wasn't anything we needed to worry about. And I think most people here, you, know, right. if you had to ask them questions about polio, they would all I don't know. You know right. That would be the response. I know nothing about it. Right. You know, so um, I can honestly say I don't know. <laughs> well, and that's why I thought it would be important <clears throat> for us to at least educate people a little bit uh, and really encourage them to really do some research on their own. But 
this is a big deal and has the potential to be a big deal. And so let's talk a little bit more about this, a little bit about the symptoms, about people who've been infected. Um, so they will have often, well, I get these sort of like flu-like symptoms. And one in four people will have things such as a throat, you know, a th sore throat, a fever, fatigue, nausea, stomach pain, just like any other kind of viral infection. About one in 25 people will actually get viral meningitis and one in 200 will actually suffer from paralysis. That's not huge, but it's big enough, right? One in 200 people getting paralysis is not that small a group. Symptoms generally start to appear between three and six days after exposure. And paralysis can then occur between seven and 21 days after exposure. And paralysis can leave you permanently unable to move your arms or legs. Uh, or both. It's most commonly, though, affecting legs. And in severe cases, as you, I showed you in the black and white photographs of the kids in iron lungs, it can actually uh, paralyze the muscles that allow you to breathe or swallow. And obviously, this could cause death. So we're talking about a pretty serious illness here. Now, I want to talk about prevention and vaccination. And um, children babies should be getting four doses of polio vaccine starting at age two months. These are injections. If you are using what are called, uh, there's two types of vaccines. There's one that's a live vaccine, which is not given anymore in the United States. I don't think it's given in, in Canada, but I don't know. And there's also one that is actually a, um, where, the vac where the virus is not live. And that's what's given here in the United States is given by injections. People starting the vaccine series after the age of four should get a total of three doses, three shots. And uh, anybody um, that does not know what their vaccine profile is, so if you're in the United States and you don't know, was I ever vaccinated? Let's say you're 30 years old and you don't ever know if you were vaccinated. You might want to consider talking to your physician and actually, actually getting a vaccine to make sure you actually are. Most adults should not need to be vaccinated. But uh, kids, um, again, if you don't know your history, you should consider getting vaccinated and talking to your physician. There are two types of vaccines that, that are important. I know we're running out of time, so I wanted to say that there are two types of vaccines. Here in the United States, there's an inactivated polio vaccine called an IPV. It's the only one that's been given in the United States since the year 2000. It requires it's administered by a shot. And it's either given in the arm or the leg. And that often depends on the age of the person. The reason it's important to understand that it's not, it's what's called an inactivated polio is that you cannot get polio from getting the shot and your feces will not be excreting polio. That's important because that ties to the second vaccine. There's something called OPV, which is used in many countries. Uh, OPV is a live polio virus. It's attenuated, but it's a live polio virus, which means that people can excrete this polio virus in their stool. Now, in many countries with poor sanitation, that becomes an issue because that feces has virus in it. And if it's that feces is in contact with someone who has no vaccine history of polio, they could actually get polio from that exposure. And that's happened in many parts of the world who still gives OPV. So why are they giving OPV? Because it can be given by anyone. It's a it's a it's not an injection, it's a drop. So when we first started getting polio vaccines here in the United States, people got a sugar cube. It's exactly the same thing. And you'll see many photographs of young kids in Africa or India or someplace like that getting a polio vaccine. They open up their mouth and they drop in the, the vaccine into their, just literally into their mouth. And that's how they get the vaccine. So it's very inexpensive. It can be administered without a health, healthcare professional doing that, but it does contain live virus. So there are literally about three cases of vaccine associated paralytic polio for about every million doses given. So that can happen. And that compares to about five cases per million of people uh, actually paralyzed by an actual infection. But still it can occur. OPV does produce immunity. 
Uh, and roughly one dose would pr produce immunity in about 50% uh, of all the recipients. And you need three doses if you're getting OPV to be fully protected. 155 countries still use OPV. And that's why we still have the opportunity to get polio through what exactly happened in New York. Somebody comes to the United States, they were vaccinated with OPV. They have a, a virus in their in their stool. It actually gets in contact with someone and that person wasn't vaccinated and they can get polio. So there's mm -hmm. a bunch of, I'll put these, I'll send you these slides because we're going to be running out of time here shortly. And people can actually go to these sites to actually learn more about polio. And here we are again, running out of time one more time. <laughs> we always run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can I say? I don't know. What can I say? Do you have any, um, even though we do have uh, two minutes uh, left or so, do you have any uh, final thoughts on some of this? Because we covered quite a bit of health issues. Right. Lately, and it seems right now we have more health concerns than ever before that we you know, need to and, be aware and of and pay attention to. Who would have thought, right? I mean, in this contemporary world we live in, who could who could think we'd be talking about diseases for 25 segments, right? Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. So what I would say to everybody is that I would just beg you all, first of all, know, learn what your vaccine history is. Contact your physicians. You should basically possess your entire vaccine history. Measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, tetanus, polio. You should know what your vaccine history is, and you should make sure that you're up to date on your vaccines. This is becoming a bigger issue as we are seeing with now polio, both in the UK and in the United States. Okay. You're you're probably just as high a risk as we are in some level. So it's really important you know what your vaccine history is. Make sure you are up to date in any many of these illnesses that you thought you would never, ever, ever have to deal with. And make sure that your kids are vaccinated as well. Yeah. So on that note, and I will also make sure that I send these slides to Alex. He'll put them up on the website. I'll also put up the monkeypox tracker for CDC so you can follow that. And I encourage you again, get vaccinated when the new booster comes out for COVID. Really, really important. Yeah. It, it, you mentioned um, chicken pox. Uh, did you know I had it twice? Oh, no, really? Yeah. Apparently, you're not supposed to get it twice. And I had it twice. Wow. <laughs> you're an overachiever, Alex. Yeah. I liked it so much the first time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Oh, yeah. What can I say? On that note, we've come to the end of another show. Regina, thank you very much for sharing all your information. I really hope uh, people are paying attention uh, to this one because uh, there's a lot of important information they need to be aware of, especially with things like uh, monkeypox, which for the most part is new to people over here. Right. You know, in the Western world, uh, at least. And polio, which we thought was gone from the Western world, um, is suddenly appearing. So, um you know, I really hope people pay attention. Thanks, Alex. Good as always to be with you. Uh, good to talk to you. And, uh, you know, we're only uh, two months, two, three months away now. We'll actually uh, see each other face to face. I know. Soon, I'm Toronto. excited so, in Toronto. Yeah, I'm me too. Excited. Yeah, Live broadcast from the Continuity Resilience Today conference in Toronto. Uh, James Green and I. So and Regina will be there. So I hope you. Uh, I'm doing a keynote that. speech and a workshop. So I hope to see everybody there. Yeah, me too. So, Regina, thank you very much once again, and okay. until next month, everybody, stay prepared, everyone. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe, and in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.